Well, hello, Bud Rankin. Well, hello. How are you this morning? I'm good. How are you doing? Well, pretty good. I've got my watering done, got my dogs taken care of, getting ready to watch baseball. Life is good. Yeah, baseball. We were watching the Cardinals last night, finally, and um, I find it humorous that they're pumping the uh, the audience noise into the stadium. Well, we shouldn't be too surprised about that. They've been doing that for sitcoms for years, you know, so there's no difference, you know. Uh, and if you really want to watch the game, I always found the, uh, the spectators a nuisance more than anything else. So I don't miss them at all. Well, it seems like somebody spent a lot of time because, like, they've even got, like, you know, when they hit a fly ball, everybody gets excited, and it's almost always a, just an out. But they've got all that piped in, too. So I bet the ratings are going to be out of sight on this for, for television. Oh, man, we were watching. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't watched – anyway, yeah, probably. And, and – uh, I mean, I've been watching Ultimate Fighting, and I'm getting into that, which I've never watched. So, oh, goodness. my son does that too. Uh, I, I'm not quite into that. There you go. Well, okay. So we had talked a while ago, but I, I kind of asked you if you wanted to talk about your history of being a teacher because you you were a teacher for I don't know thirty like, years, 30, 30 plus years, and you taught in rural Missouri and suburban Missouri, but and it didn't quite fit in, but, but so we've been talking, we talked just a few days ago, um, and you were interested in talking about your history of white privilege, because it's something you feel you've been aware of for a long time. Well, you know, I started out with parents who were very, very prejudiced. I learned my prejudice the way prejudice is often taught. In the 40s, I would see, my parents would see a black person and it would always be a put down or a joke. Uh, and so by the time I was, oh, certainly 12 years old, I was as prejudiced as anybody could be. Uh, a lot of that came to an end when, it, when schools were integrated. And all of a sudden I had to face my own prejudices with the reality of experiencing African Americans on a one-to-one -one basis. And all of a sudden, I realized one time playing football that there was at least one black person who was a hell of a lot better ball player than I was. And if that was true, then maybe they also wasn't stupid or immoral or dangerous or any of those things. So that was, that was quite an evolution for me. Uh, and, you know, when, when I was younger, African Americans would have to sit in the back of the, the movie theaters. And that... Uh, always had a confusion for me when I was young. But uh, by the time I was in my middle 60s, uh, I realized just how stupid prejudice truly is. And if you have any intelligence at all and begin to examine your own feelings, you realize how wrong they are. I was had a real experience when in my small town, African-Americans, there was a baseball league of, of adults, and they were not allowed, actually, every time they tried to, to get on a team, nobody would accept them, or, so they finally put together a, a team of their own, but they couldn't get the, the uh, parks uh, league to accept their team, so I actually became a reverse Jackie Robinson in this case, because I was the only white person on the team, and they accepted our team, and for a year I played on an all-African-American team. Now, surprisingly to me, the hatred was directed at me more than they were at the African-Americans. And uh, I can remember I had two small kids, and my, I received threats against them. Uh, my house was egged, et cetera, et cetera. But to show you how prejudice can break down, the very next year, the team that needed a pitcher asked our African American pitcher if he they would play he would play with them. And within one year that all came to an end. Because everybody grabbed a player from the African American team that they needed to fill out their team. And uh, so I, I realized then that when people actually experience interaction with people of, of different faiths or cultures or color, 
oftentimes uh, those those kind of hatreds fade away. It's almost like in the 60s when racists would say, well, I'm not a racist. I like Bob Gibson, okay? Uh, and not realizing that they truly were racist. Uh, racism, I, I thought made a big turn whenever we elected Obama, but what I didn't realize it was only going to fuel greater racism than had existed uh, before. I can remember uh, I was teaching my last year in a Catholic school, and I asked one of the, she was a darling of a, of a girl, an athlete, she went on to Marquette and, and played basketball, and I asked her, I said, tell me something, do you think the staff here is racist? And she actually laughed in my face, and she says, yeah, Mr. Rankin, besides you and two or three other people, they're all racist, and they don't even know it. And I said, well, how can that be? And they said, well, I guess they, they thought after the 60s, when they into integration had been completed and, and uh, they were no longer hanging African Americans from a tree, that uh, that meant racism was over. But racism is much deeper than that. It's a, it's a preconceived idea of what different people are like. And, you know, obviously racism doesn't just extend into, uh, into uh, a prejudice doesn't just mean racism, but it certainly is, it seems to me it's, it, it has really raised its head recently with the, the BL, uh, BLM movement. So you, let's go back. What when, when you were in school and integration came about, what year was that? I know it was in the 60s, right? I think. Now you, you, I'm seven, going to be 79, so my memory is not as always as sharp as it used to be, but I think it was somewhere around 54, 55, somewhere in there. Okay, and that was in rural Missouri? Well, that was, I think, uh, almost all of Missouri. Okay. Uh, uh, it may have been 55, too. I can't remember exactly. Right? But I can remember it was a big deal, okay? Uh, and at the time, as I said, I, I was racist. And what I didn't realize is uh, only recently people have been talking about uh, white privilege. And if you, you know, if you ask almost anybody, they will tell you that white privilege, oh, no, they've never had white privilege. Well, many years ago, I had a, uh, had a chance to, by a friend of mine who asked me, uh, we were discussing, actually, the, the benefits. I don't think that we even used the term white privilege, but it certainly applied. And he said, well, there's only one way you can ever really understand white privilege. And he said, go back into your life and pick times whenever something very important was going to happen and you, you really needed it and you wanted it, and then ask yourself, if you would have been black, would you have had those same opportunities? And so I literally did that, okay? And there were at least three times when my life took turns that wouldn't have taken that turn had I been an African American. One of those times was when I was, the same time that the integration was taken on, I was no longer living at home. I was just 16. And uh, I, I think I'd call myself a thief. I was not, you know, holding people up or beating people up. But if I found something loose that I could get my hands on, me and two other guys certainly did that. Uh, and then one day, in the, uh, one day I was still in school because that's where the girls were. You had to go to school to find girls, right? So, uh, uh, there was an announcement that Jimmy Woods was looking for uh, somebody to, uh, for a job. I went, but I didn't think I had a, had a chance at it. Well, I got the job. Now, going back forward, I'm looking back at that. Had I been African-American, would I have gotten that job? Absolutely not. It wouldn't have happened. Then when I wanted to go to college, I didn't have the money to go, so I needed a job that I could work nights. Uh, I applied for a, a job that was a factory job, but I could work nights and go to school days. 
Well, uh, at that time, a couple of my African Americans applied for that same factory job. None of them got it. Okay, uh, I did. That allowed me to go college, to go to college. That's white privilege. Then I graduated from from college, and I wanted to stay close enough to the college so I could get my master's. So I I had a so small select place where I could still travel back and forth. And I needed a job in a rural school. I applied for it. I would have never gotten that job, and I wouldn't have been able to to go on. And then my next career job, I moved to another larger, but still small rural school. They would have never hired me. Okay, that's white privilege. Okay, uh, to this day, those schools never have hired an African American. And to this date, I would doubt seriously if they ever would in the near future. So I think sometimes when we, you know, I, I mean, I am proud of the fact that I worked nights, went to school days, and graduated in three and a half years with honors, and I have a master's degree plus 48 hours, 50. Yeah, so I'm proud of that. But those opportunities wouldn't have been there for me, I don't believe, if I was going to be honest. So when, when, when somebody says, I've worked hard all my life, I haven't had any privilege. Well, I did, in my lifetime, my experience, that still wouldn't have gotten me where I'm at under the same circumstances. You know, ask somebody, you know, if you go up to a, a, a true white supremacist and ask, ask them if they're racist, what do you think they're going to say? Yeah, I'm racist. Nobody ever admits they're racist. They just say, I'm proud, proud to be white. But that doesn't make me a racist, okay? Uh, so, well, I, I think the whole country sometimes denies the fact that we're that way, but we're not willing to admit it. I, I find it interesting that you brought up baseball earlier. Yeah, I feel I feel like yeah I feel like sports and baseball in specific have really been um, a big vehicle for for these kind of changes in the way we look at each other as Americans based on the color of our skin and and you know, racism right because you look back at Jackie Robinson which was shortly after World War II um, and now you look at at teams kneeling at the national anthem on the line or not kneeling you know whatever. So you were, where were you when when this when these baseball teams were were forming and you were you were on this baseball team with, with uh with you were the only white you were the token white guy. On the <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. I, I, jokingly, it was a big joke uh, privately among us. Yes, uh, and I mean, <laughs> I wasn't really trying to to. To, to be any kind of a Jackie Robinson. In fact, I was shocked at the, at friends of mine who I lost, who I had been, been playing sports with forever, who turned on me so quickly it was unreal. Uh, so uh, it just seemed wrong, okay, that some of the people I'd known in high school now couldn't play sports, okay? Uh, and, you know... It's amazing, though, how quickly that changed. But, uh, you know, to be honest, sports and your field, entertainment, uh, have been leaders of, in this, okay? But people will separate that. They'll say, okay, uh, yeah, I would root for, for Jackie Robinson, Bob Gibson, Kurt Flood, Lou Brock, and at the same time won't apply that in their own personal life. It's a difference, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think it, it, uh, we're living in some very, very interesting times right now. This has been coming for for, for some time. Uh, as a historian, we go through cycles when we don't want any change whatsoever. We had the '60s and the '70s, and oh my God, please give us some stability. Okay, here comes Grandpa. Okay, Ronald Reagan's going to come in and say everything is better now. Okay, we don't have to worry about all these things. And, and, and the country settled down into a conservative period that has remained relatively there uh, until 
I would say the last eight years or so, we're experiencing a, a big change. Well, whenever change happens, it, it, older people have a great deal of trouble with this, okay? Uh, when you get to a certain age, you think you know everything and you don't want anything to be different and anything that confronts what you already believe. Thank God we have young people who will come along and say, that's dumber than shit, you know, and, 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 and demand that, that people take a different turn. Along with this, though, it's not just that. It's, it's our attitude towards sex. It's our attitudes to transgenders and gays. You know, when I, for a long time when I was teaching, if uh, I saw somebody I was worried about because of their, the way the other t students looked at them, because they were mistreated. If anybody suspected that, you know, you put an air ring in and all of a sudden, you know, your whole sexual composition changes, which is dumber than hell too. But that's, that was the attitude for a long, long, long time. But by the time, I'm very happy to, to say that by the time I retired from teaching, young people were accepting that without it, you know, and thinking anyone who felt that way was just, you know, they were just wrong. Well, now, let's look at my generation who looks at us. What do you mean? That's not between a man and a woman, you know? If you don't have the parts, you don't get to play the game, okay? Uh, uh, so we are living at a time when the older generation, my generation, is being confronted about some changes that makes them feel very, very challenged to, to be kind to it. More like actually frightened, okay? And whenever that takes place, fear then becomes a motivator that can be used for unscrupulous people, uh, both locally and nationally. Uh, and I think we're living in a time of change, and change is, you know, I lived through the, the 1960s, uh, when that same, I think it's greater now than it ever was in the 60s, to be quite frank with you, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, there was that, you know, you turn on All in the Family, which portrayed that so wonderfully and humorously. And I really wish some really smart people would say, this is a perfect time for not the same show, but a similar show. I think it would re receive huge ratings, okay? Because I think people will have a chance to laugh at, at some of the things they fear. Uh, you know, Archie, Archie Bunker, uh, would, would, a, a modern Archie Bunker would be awesome right now. Um, so, and, 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 you know, and of course, change is happening in education, which is just as dramatic. It's happening everywhere. You know, jobs are being, destroy, being not destroyed, but replaced by, by technology. And anybody who has one of those kind of jobs is sitting there saying, holy cow, what am I going to do? Okay. Teaching is changing. I used to be made fun of so much by teachers when I said that, we will be doing computer and online teaching in the near future. It's cheaper. And actually, in many ways, it offers, you know, for years we've had to slow down. We've had to speed up the kids who didn't have as much ability, going faster than they could. And we had to take the smarter kids and say, no, we can't go that fast. I know you already know this, but just kind of go along with it, okay? I'm sure as bright as you were, you experienced some of that. And you sat there saying, oh, God, this is boring as hell. But now, technology says you can go as fast as you can go. It doesn't matter that we, you know, think, think, think of the, the idea that if you're 16, this is how much ability you have. And there's something wrong with you if you don't. Or if you have too much of it, there's something wrong with you. Not everybody 16 is going to have the same ability, not physically, not emotionally, not mentally. And yet we've kept people in these tracks for as long as the education perhaps, well, that's not true. Back whenever you had one-on-one -on -one education with private people who could afford their teacher, you could go as fast as you wanted to, or as slow as you needed to. But all that's changed now. And now we, we're still, oh my goodness, teachers, rightly so, are petrified going into this fall, as well they should. 
because they're at, being asked to do things for which they've never been trained, never been asked to, and at the same time putting their lives on the line while doing so. Uh, and then being made fun of because they, they, they don't want to go back and, and take the kids in anymore. Which, if you know anybody who's a committed teacher, they'd rather go back to things were a year ago before this all happened and have their kids back. But that's not happening as I see it. So you, um, you said something interesting earlier. You said, by the time I was in my middle 60s, I realized how stupid being prejudiced was. was no, did it take I, that? Oh, in the, in the 60s. Not in my the 60s. 60s. Okay. All right. Okay. If I may have said that wrong. Okay, because I, I was like, man, well, no, 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 okay. no, 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 not in the 60s. Uh, not my 60s. Understandable. Yeah. So you said, you also said that, you know, when change happens, the older population struggles with it, which is, you know, pretty normal. But I think we've seen a lot of, and I've been really surprised, um, you know, there are a lot of people being caught on videotape or even people at demonstrations I'm talking about white people that are demonstrating things that I, I honestly didn't know existed. Like, just, I mean, starting with George Floyd, I, I have no concept of passing off a counterfeit $20 bill, you know, which I'm sure I've done at some point in my life, and then having a police officer sit on my neck for eight and a half minutes. I, I, have no, I had no concept that that was even – a remote possibility and and then I but then I see it, um, at a lot of these protests where um, you see the white supremacist groups coming in and trying to sow discord behind you know they come in behind everybody try to light a, a place on fire and we have seen that and those are young people yeah and those are young people with lots of energy for what they believe and I mean where do you think all that is coming from on I don't feel like I've seen that before. Maybe it's just because it hasn't been available on video. I don't feel like I've seen that overt racism the way I've been seeing it over the past, I guess, three or four months. Well, believe me, I saw it in the 60s, okay? The protest of the 60s, you know, if you look at uh, some of the things that happened there, it was probably even more powerful. Uh, you know, that, I mean... Nixon really got elected because he was promoting this uh, law and order theme, which, by the way, notice is being now promoted as well for the same reasons, okay? That's why that fear factor that, that uh, comes along. Uh, if you, uh, you, you, have, you have several groups, that, you have even police that uh, are are in the groups appearing to be protesters when they're actually undercover policemen. In fact, there's a case right now where a undercover policeman in Ferguson, who was at the Ferguson, who got beaten by the police, uh, who now, uh, that, that case is still going on, okay? It's coming to the front. In other words, you know what I'm talking about? It's no, an I undercover, don't. Uh, undercover policeman was actually in the Ferguson demonstrations and was attacked by real, well, not real, but police who were trying to keep order, and, and, uh, and now he is suing the police department, okay? Uh, so you have th those groups. Um, one of the problems you have with protests is that the peaceful people who are actually going to be peaceful will have all kinds of groups who will try to exploit it for their own end. And there is actually criminals that will be going in there and saying, this is my chance to loot, okay? And that does take place. I could be naive. I haven't been in a protest in a number of years. Uh, I, I will, I, I tell you, talk about shocking, if I can change the subject, but you grew up in St. Charles. Aren't you shocked by the fact that there were the, the protests that occurred in St. In St. Charles? In white St. Charles, there were at least five or six of them, okay? Some of them led by, by students who were from schools that I taught in and you went to. That could have never happened before. Not even possible, okay? But believe me, that's an opportunity for people who will use it. And, and they did so in the 60s, and they're, and they're doing so now. So that, 
that's not that shouldn't be a surprise. But the fact that there are so many, not just African Americans complaining about about this, and actually they have been joined by so many uh, Caucasians. I think it's it's a sign that people want some kind of a change in in this system. And and, and by the way, let's let's not throw. There are wonderful policemen who want to do the right thing, okay? But uh, they're in a position that makes them very difficult for them from the bottom. This is not something from the bottom up that can happen because uh, it's, it's going to take a, a systematic change in how we police. For one thing, Lots of people that the police were, are coming into contact with are not criminals, they're mentally challenged. Uh, when we stopped, uh, back when Reagan stopped uh, funding some of the mental health clinics that we had, we put those people on the street. And by definition, I don't, I think most police officers would agree with me that they're not trained to deal necessarily with a, a, a person who has mental illness or perhaps not even illness, but uh, drug problems when their reality is, is, is vastly different. And uh, so the whole idea needs to be, there needs to be different training and there needs to be, you know, some people who know how to deal with a, a, a person who has some of these problems. I, I spent four years working at the Boys Town, uh, which had a whole group of young people who, for a variety of reasons, were, were placed at, at Boys Town yeah. St. James. And you couldn't deal with them and approach to have the same approach as you would with a student who was having problems in a normal classroom. And, uh, and so I, I don't think, and, and believe me, it took me some catching up to do the first few months there with some uh, people who were helping me uh, learning how to interact and communicate with someone who, I don't know, that, that's not a good word, who's not uh, in the normal, no, I see, I wanted to get away from that word. What's a better word than normal? Uh, but someone who don't have the challenges that some of the people that are on the street now and, and who wind up in the homes as well, okay? Uh, we have an absolutely terrible, terrible uh, system of incar incarcerating people. Uh, on a percentage rate, just look how many we lock people up. Uh, and then after we locked them up, we turn them back out and we wonder why there hasn't been any changes made. Okay. Uh, so they, you know, so they're arrested again and we're right back to the same cycle. Uh, and uh, if you look at some of the other countries who are doing this at a much better systems, Germany comes to mind where uh, they don't see it as punishment. They see it as, as, as changing people's behavior. And I've always argued that punishment really doesn't work. It doesn't deter behavior. And I used to say to my, some of my students, and I'll say this to you now, pick out a time when you did something wrong. Now, you don't have to tell everybody what you did, but you're going to do something wrong, okay, that you know is wrong or you could get in trouble for it. I would bet money, whatever that is that you're thinking of now, that you planned it so darn well that you were almost 100% positive that you're not going to get caught. So it wouldn't matter whatever the punishment was because you're not going to get caught dead in the first place. And that's, <laughs> think about it. And that's why punishment doesn't work because people don't go into it with the idea that they're going to be punished. So in order to change behavior, you can't use it as you're evil and bad, and I'm going to punish you, and that's going to change you. Uh, uh, some of that is because philosophically we live with this, you know, hell, heaven, bad, good, you know, uh, and, and, and those things just don't work. You know, in, in my classroom, I had to hand out a list of rules, which I just kind of made up, and then never followed them. Uh, 
uh, I said basically, I'm going to treat you good, and I'm going to teach you with treat you with respect. And if you do things that are, are, are going to be harmful, then I'm going to do bad things to you. Okay? And then I never did the bad things, you know, like sending. I, I sent two kids to the office in 38 years. Okay? One of them was drunk, and one of them threw a chair through the window, and I really didn't have any choice. Through um, a what? Through a window? Picked up a, a desk and threw it into the window. Oh. Yeah. And so I said, you're right. You're going to the principal, you know. Uh, he wasn't mad at me. He was mad because I wouldn't let him go see the principal. So he says, you're going to make me go to the principal. And I said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. And then he just picked up the chair and threw it into the window. I said, you're right. You win. Okay. Uh, I, I tried to use the alternative things. In fact, some of my ex-students were talking about this on Facebook the other day. Uh, if somebody was going to the bathroom too much, I had to pull on my little wooden train with, that made little noises, choo, 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 as they were pull, pulling it and going to the bathroom. Uh, if they didn't have their work, they had, uh, they rented their, they rented their, the first day of school, I used to say, you're running your chair for me. And they said, what do you mean you're running your chair? I said, well, in order for you to, to have the chair that I'm running to you, you're going to have to have your homework. And if you don't have your homework, then you, what happens to people who didn't pay the rent? They have to stand. And the kids would look at me and say, oh, yeah, right. And the first next day, whenever they came in, there would be six or seven of them who, in fact, didn't have their homework. And I set it up. you got to be evicted. And they'd stand. And well, Wait a minute. That sounds like a punishment. No, no, it's a deterrent. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. Uh, but believe me, I, I had the greatest, well, that's better than what normally is done. I'm going to give you 50% for your homework. Now, who in the hell wants to do something for 50%? Gotcha. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, they just don't do it. Okay? Uh, if they stood, they would paid their, their, their rent, so they got to turn their homework in later without any penalty Understand. okay so you know if you stood all hour you're probably going to do that homework as hell i stood all hour i better get credit for this anyway i've been standing here for but it, believe me it didn't last long and another thing i would do is if i had a real problem with the student's behavior i'd have lunch with them uh it, it, it was the best thing i ever did okay I wouldn't send them to the office. I wouldn't light them up. I'd say, we've got a problem here. I don't know what to do. You're going to have to help me. I'll talk to you during lunch. So I'd go in, find them in the lunch line, walk with them to the lunch line, have them come sit down with me. And, of course, when you're in high school and you're at lunchtime, what do you want to do? Do you want to sit here and talk with me? Okay. And, of course, then all the friends go by and say, you know, you're, and we never would talk about whatever the problem was. I'd talk if they were into sports, I'd talk them about that. If they were into cars, I'd talk them about that. If they were in music, theater, whatever it was, we talked the whole time. I said, gosh, at the end of it, I said, you know, we never got around to talking about that kind of behavior you're having. And I don't know what to do about it, but look, if we don't, if we got the problem next tomorrow, we can have lunch because I don't have anybody to have lunch with. So it, 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 there never was a problem after that. Uh, and, so, and, and, that, and that's not punishment, really. It's not like sending somebody to the office. It's not like giving them a, a detention. It's, it's, a, it's a related, what, what, what was the word you used? Deterrent. Deterrent, deterrent. yeah, it's a related. So the, the deterrent is related to what's happening and not like, okay, you're homeless, so we lock you up in prison. Well, that's, right. those, aren't, those aren't related, right? No, um, no, you know, well, I've got a problem, and I'm yeah, a lot, yeah. yeah, right. Okay. You have an addiction problem, and instead of going and finding, you know, I know we do try, we do try to find the the sources of everything and shut them down. But we'll, we'll take a 16 year old kid and lock him up for having a bag of pot, and and ruin his whole life, you know, over right. that. Right, and, and that will happen more point. often than not. It'll happen more for black kids <laughs> than it will for white <laughs> kids, for sure. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, so, it is. So, can we talk a little bit about this in our historical context? Because you were a history teacher, and you and I talk a lot, and, and we love to talk history. Sure. Um, 
so if we look at, at the movement and this, the civil rights movement in the 60s, and you had clearly delineated leaders. You had Martin Luther King Jr., you had Malcolm X, and those are the two that we really go to because they were kind of the, you know, the same goal, different paths, right? right. And they were the biggest leaders, and Martin Luther King Jr. clearly was what be, became the, the inspiration of the entire movement. Right. This time, it doesn't seem that we have a, um, I don't know, the, a, a figurehead to this movement right. other than, you know, George Floyd is a dead man and wasn't looking for, um, wasn't looking for that kind of leadership. So we've got a cause to rally around, but we don't have any specific leadership. And what does that say in context? If you take the 60s civil rights movement with that leadership that really pushed it to the forefront versus now where there, there is no specific, it's really just a cause that's come to the forefront. It's technology, pure and simple. Technology doesn't require a leader. Technology requires only a cause. And therefore, we have uh, a movement that's not just, by the way, this movement. If you look at the uh, QAnon movement, okay, there's no leader there either, and that's on the, on the other side. So you can have this all because you can interconnect. And by the way, that same thing is true with, with terrorism. It's one of the reasons why killing Bin Laden was nice and it made some people very happy, but it certainly didn't end terrorism because it doesn't, those no longer require a leader. You can interconnect people with a cause without having one person directing the activity, which, which in some way is dysfunctional, but it also means that it's very, very difficult to respond to. Because how do you respond to some place if there's not a set philosophy, a set leader? I mean, if, if you uh, if you talk about the BLM movement, there's not a, a, a set leader. I mean, there are several, and they all have a different platform, but there's not a Martin Luther King. Well, the same thing is true for, uh, for white nationalism and terrorism now. Who's the leader of the Muslim terrorists right now? I bet you can't give me a name. Okay, because I don't know it, and I doubt seriously if there, quote, is one, all right? So technology has changed this dramatically. When Martin Luther King became the leader, uh, the government started really looking for things to discredit him. Uh, Jimmy Hopper, uh, Jimmy Hopper, who's head of the FBI then? Uh, Hoover. Yeah. J. Edgar Hoover targeted him and started investigating him, looking for anything, any dirt, to discredit the leader, and there, therefore discredit the movement. But if there is no leader, that doesn't work, okay? So it is a, uh, in some ways, it, it makes it very difficult to, for any response to it. But on the other hand, it almost makes it impossible to destroy. So consequently, we're going to be having this, and it's going to be probably in other areas as well. Uh, because of technology. So, uh, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives exactly. Matter movement, BLM. I, I've said on a few of my podcasts that for me, it's about my friends who are black. It's not about you know an organization and how it's run. The general protest it, when someone brings up that they don't support Black Lives Matter, they're going to point to the Marxists that are running it and, and the organization. So what are your thoughts around that? Well, I think basically it's an attempt to, to do what we just talked about that's, that's not proven very successful, okay? Uh, so when people uh, attack the Black Lives Matter, unless they're really deep into it, they couldn't give you two leaders of the BLM movement if you ask them. But they tell you they were against it, and it's awful, and it's terrible that's now on the, uh, that uh, the St. Louis Cardinals are all, and all of Major League Baseball did it, okay? And it's on the mound in, in, in Bush Stadium, okay? Uh, but the, the, there's no way, the, there's no way to discredit it, because again, you can't discredit the, the you can't get the person that to nail this to. Okay. Uh, currently, there's a on the 
people I follow uh, that's in my Facebook group are so worried about socialism. This is socialistic. This is socialistic, you know. Then I go on to prove that Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment, a whole list of, this has been a socialistic country without ever calling it socialism, okay? And that's because for, uh, way back in the 50s, communism and socialism in most people's minds were the same thing. They are not. But if you ask the average American, I think they would tell you, oh, yeah, they're the same thing, okay? Well, that's not true at all. Uh, there are, one's an economic system, one's a political system. You can have a, uh, a capitalistic society and a dictatorship. You can have a socialistic uh, and a dictatorship. You can have socialism and a democracy. You can have capitalism and a democracy. There are two different systems integrated, right? but not in most people's minds, I'm afraid. And I think probably, you know, here's the thing. Look at countries that, uh, that are dealing with large populations like China. China has to have, because it's sheer numbers, more rules and regulations, which is some people would call socialism. I don't, but they would. Anytime you increase numbers, you increase rules. If you want, don't want any rules, go live on a mountaintop by yourself. You can do whatever and how you want to. If you, if you were ever in a classroom that had 7, 10, 12 people, there were few rules there, okay, because you didn't need rules. I taught a class one time of 39, and I guarantee you I had to have more structure than I've ever had in my life. Didn't want to, 39 requires structure, you know. I remember when my father first told me that there was a, a stipulation on how fast you could drive. Oh, he was ticked. Oh, he was mad. My car, why shouldn't I drive as fast as I want to, okay? And I'm sitting there at the time thinking, Dad, there's other people out here on the road. Well, when he started driving, there was hardly anybody out on the road, okay? Anytime you increase numbers, you increase structure. And that, that is always going to be the case. And so as, you know, at one time, this was such a large country physically and so few people, we could be independent Americans. Well, yeah, we almost had to be independent Americans. But now, as we move into, you know, that, that's why this, this, this movement with the, the virus, I read this, and you, maybe you told me this, but it seems to me that people have to view this as we're all in the same ocean, but we're in different boats. In other words, if you're in a, in, in, a, in a, an area like New York City that relies on sub, subways and things like that and there's interaction with people, you're going to have to have more structure there than you will if you're living in Alaska. One of my ex-students lives, was actually my son's ex-student, he lives in Alaska and he, you know, he, he hardly sees anybody but a few times a year when he goes in to get supplies, okay? Well, he doesn't need rules, okay? But if you, anytime you had Anytime you add another person in your life, you're restricting your own freedom. It's called marriage. As soon as you get married, all of a sudden there's a lot more structure and you've lost some of your freedom that you could when you wasn't, right? Uh, well, the good part about that is you gain something back when you add people too. Uh, we are social animals by nature. Uh, and obviously we're missing that social interaction. Uh, and when I say we're different, it's different at age. You know, I, I just got my, my blood work done and I'm in range and everything. But I'm also going to turn 79. If I get this virus, I'm dead. My immune system won't be able to beat it, okay? I mean, uh, that's just fact. I look at this virus a whole lot different than somebody who's 22 years old and thinks they're going to live forever and they've got a sound immune system and they don't have any underlying conditions. Now, they may have some damage from this, but the likelihood of surviving. So I view this vastly different. Uh, so it's not only where you live, it's your age, it's your health, okay? People don't realize that just because you're 25 don't mean you don't have health problems. There's tons of people who have uh, 25 and they've got uh, diabetes, okay? 
Well, that's not good for this virus at all. Uh, and we're talking about social changes. Let's talk about that for a second. This is going to extend a while because I'm not very optimistic that we're going to have things that's going to put us back to, quote, normal. Last year at this time, normal, anytime soon. So we're, we're going to have to realize that there's, quote, a new normal. Uh, as you know, I'm a social animal. But I have seen hardly anybody. I saw you the other day from about six to eight feet apart outside. That's, and that was a rare treat to see another human being, okay? But I have adjusted to my, my life, and it isn't a bad life that I don't have the, 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 able to do the same things I used to do. You know, just imagine, you know, my generation, and I was slightly too old. Fortunately, I didn't have to go. You'd ask some of my friends when they were being drafted to go to Vietnam, now look, you don't have to go to Vietnam and you don't have to go through the jungle and you don't have to have people shooting at you. You're just going to have to stay home, see nobody else hardly, and watch, big, watch TV. Which do you think they'd have chosen? You know, like this is such a huge challenge for people to adjust to. I can't buy, you know. Now, for people who are in different economic systems, different both, when they need to get, get to go to work because they can't pay the rent and feed their kids, and they need schools to open up because they need the teachers to be the babysitters we never wanted to be, or called anyway, that's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? Okay? So we're in different boats. And so when somebody says, well, I feel this way, well, they're probably just in a different boat. All right? Uh, you know, my wife retired this year before this happened, I want to point out, and I am thrilled that she did, okay? Because otherwise everybody would be saying she bailed because of the virus and then she'd be catching crap because of that, which isn't true. She'll probably still catch that crap, but it's not true. Think of the 25% of the teachers who have some underlying condition, Okay. Yeah. And who have been told you need to get in there and take and, and take and, and do what you're supposed to do. Okay. They're in a different boat, aren't they? Yeah. All right. All well, right. They could have spouses with underlying conditions, or you know, or, or or kids, even small kids who have underlying conditions. You know, I mean, it's a. Uh, we have to realize that we're more interdependent and interconnected than maybe we thought we were. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, have, I got one last thing, and we're going to go back a little bit. And, and you can add whatever you want, but I, you talk about you played football with African-American guys, and you realize, hey, we're, you know, they're not so bad. You know, that was kind of the start of your – Not so, of, so bad. They were better. Okay. They <laughs> weren't even close. Okay. Well, that, and that was the start of you, you starting to see that we're all just people, right? Right. But – it seems like you, you may, a lot of people around you were struggling with that and, or not struggling, just didn't take that same point of view, even when seeing the facts in front of them. What do you think, like, what do you think opened you up to, to that? Why were you a little more open to that maybe than those around you? But let me, I'm going to go back a little bit and I have an idea and then you can just, then I'll let you expound on it. So you've told me a story from when you were younger and your your family was German, correct? And, or of German ancestry? Oh, they both were German. Both yeah. German. Both. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and so they spoke German in the house, and you had learned some German, and you went to school in the I guess the early fifties, Nixon, Missouri. Yeah, in Nixon, Missouri. You know, so not that long after World War II, and you said something in German, and and took a beating for it. Yeah. And so at that moment in your life, something that was just true about who you were caused you a significant amount of physical pain. Do you think that might have something to do with your, your, your immediate openness to somebody who is in a similar situation? Or, or what, do you, what do you think? And what do you think I, for us that can do that for us? I, think I, was, I, think, I don't think it was that. Because I really suppressed that. I didn't speak German after that. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want anything to do with it. But as I told you, my parents were very poor. I went to 13 schools the first six years. 
13. Okay. So I never got into a school where I wasn't the odd kid, the black kid, the out kid, the, the kid who wasn't being accepted. By the time I started to, to make some friends, I was at another school and started all over again. So I think I had, a, had some kind of a compassion because I was the out kid for so long when I was growing up that I was looking and thinking, that's what's wrong here, okay? Uh, they didn't know me. They were, and you know, finally when I got to the seventh grade, I was in the same school for the rest of the way. But in, until that time, I was always the out kid, just like African Americans. Most of the time, a lot of the time, they're the odd kid out. Okay, when they go in the store, they're the odd kid out. When they go to the theater, they're the odd kid out. Uh, when Jackie Robinson was playing ball, he was the odd kid out, okay? Uh, and I think that probably caused me to assess that differently if I, if I had always, and I was poor, so even when I was going to school, I was still not in the in group, okay? Or even the accepted group. In fact, when I went, after I finished, uh, had to do my student teaching, I specifically went back to my home school. And when I walked into that school with my briefcase, two of the older teachers saw me and ran to the principal immediately saying, what's he doing in this, class, in this school? Okay. Uh, so I was never, you know, in the in-group to begin with. And had I been in the in-group, then I think you're always easier to exclude anyone else, whether they're Jewish or they're uh, Indian, Mexican, whatever, okay? Uh, so I think I've always been more open to that because of those early experiences when I was a kid. Uh, more so than probably if I hadn't had those experiences. I don't think it makes me a better person. I'm not suggesting that. I think I just had a different experience. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm one of these people who, who really work hard at, at trying to understand what I'd be like if I was in a different set of circumstances. I even imagined that. You know, the other day I was talking with somebody. We were talking about uh, the legacy of slavery. Now, you know me fairly well, and, 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 and much to some of our mutual friends, Grant, I am much more open to, to other people, as you just said. But what if I would have been born in 1830 to a slave owner and had all the privilege of, of being a slave owner's son with all the wealth, okay? I would like to think that I'd be the same person who would say, that's wrong. We need to free these slaves. While well, I was going off to college and, and enjoying the life and the, and the privilege that came with it. I'd like to tell you that. I don't think I can. Okay? So I think whenever we, we look at currently or in the past, it's so easy to say, boy, I'm so superior. I'd never do that. Okay? Uh, or what if I would have been a uh, uh, living in the West in the 1860s and 70s when uh, the only good Indian was a dead Indian, and I'm living out there alone with my family, and I'm afraid that sometime a, a, a roving band could attack my house. How do you think I'd feel about Indians? Would I be as open and say, boy, this is wrong, and look what we did to him? Or do you think I'd be, what, you know... So, so it, it's so easy to condemn people for beliefs that we have that are current and popular now and apply them to people of the past. I call it presentism. It's saying our values, why, how can you be that way, you know? Uh, and uh, I, I think that will, uh, would lead to a, a lot more, uh, not acceptance, but understanding. You know, you can't accept what, the way people treated people in the past, but at least you can have some more of an understanding of it, uh, which I think is important. 
okay? Uh, and uh, that's something I don't think Americans do very well as a group. Now, if you'd have sat in my class, you'd have been forced to put, put in those positions and said, how would you have felt if, you know, they get, some of my students had to write, write on things like this, okay? <laughs> Which one of them just pointed out not too long ago on Facebook. You realize all the questions you ask us that nobody hell or whatever think of, and I'm glad nobody ever has again, so. <laughs> but thinking is important. And that's what I think education is about. Which you talk, let me get one more thing in here before you cut me off. I, want, I think it's really important. I think it's really important to understand how education has changed from when I first started teaching. Well, we have so formalized and we have factory made education where certain facts have to be put on as this kid comes down the assembly line. I'm going to attach the. Uh, I'm going to. Pythagorean theorem goes on here, so I'm putting you on, okay? The American Revolution, i got to get you in 1776, it goes on here. And we never ask kids to think about any of those things. If they got the facts right, they take the test, and they pass it, and they say, so I don't think we teach thinking anymore. I think we have, with these standardized tests, we have formalized education that I don't think is good. Because if I was working with something that was just really working with these, this group I had in front of me, I might stay with that for two or three days and run that thing to the death and not move on to the next topic simply because I knew it was going to be on the test, which you have to do now. And then we take these formalized tests and we compare. It's almost as bad as comparing kids at the same age and say they all should be the same. Comparing... Uh, Francis Howe, where I taught with where I, where I grew up in Chillicothe High School, and expect those kids to make the same grades, the same behavior. There's no child left behind. is about as brainless as anything I've ever heard. You can't compare the social, economic, and the financial ability of this one school with another and then say one school's doing good and one school's doing bad. And that's what we've done with education. And that is... In the process, we don't teach anything. that You don't have to think about it. You just know what this is, and you're good enough, and move on down the line. Uh, it's almost making, uh, we've computerized people, so they just got to have this certain input, you know. And if you put that input, you get that output, but there's nothing happens in between. I'll quit now and let you go, and thank you for having me on, okay? That's great, bud. Thanks for sharing, and I uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> well, this is one where you didn't have to talk that much, did you? <laughs> <laughs> it's always the goal. <laughs> well, you take care and, and, uh, and uh, say hello to your lovely wife for me, kids, okay? Will do. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye-bye.